And at that time, I remember I was like a little over surfing. Like mm -hmm. I just didn't want to go surfing, mm -hmm. which was so weird. Because now kind of come full circle, like almost 10 years later, a little over 10 years later, because I'm 40 now, I'm like the frothingest grom mm -hmm. about surfing mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. Like I'm just so pumped. Yeah. And re-inspired. Yes. About surfing. And like what a beautiful feeling it is to ride a wave. Yeah. Like what? That was Cassia Meador. I'm Jamie Grissick. You're listening to Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More of a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 120 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Cassia Mayador grew up in Agoura, California. She started surfing Malibu at a young age. She stepped on the board like she'd been doing it her entire life. She became a Roxy girl at a young age, and she went all around the world, a kind of odyssey, all of which we're going to get into very soon. I've written about her several times over the years. I think it's safe to say that she's one of the greatest living longboarders today. Cassia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jamie. Yes, and we're sitting in your van in the Malibu parking lot, which is a historical place. I'm sure we both have many memories here. It started here for you to some extent, yeah? Absolutely. I mean, Malibu is an iconic place. You know, Malibu is like has been a gathering place for thousands and thousands of years. You know, beyond just like us surfing and meeting up here to go ride its perfect waves. And uh, definitely when I showed up on this beach when I was 15 years old, for me, everything changed, you know, and this place and this parking lot and everything about it felt like home, Yeah, you know, and it still does. When you got here at age 15, what year would that have been? Gosh, when I was 15, I'm 40 now. So that was 25 years ago. It would have been 1998. Okay. And what was the scene like then? You know, the scene was pretty rad. It was um, a lot smaller than it is today, definitely. There wasn't as many people riding longboards and there wasn't as many people just surfing in general and there just wasn't many as many humans on the planet. Yeah. Just in general, yes. you know? It's yeah. like during the weekday, in the summer, we'd be down at the Palapa. You know, all of us would be hanging out there and yeah, it'd get kind of crowded, but the majority of like the shortboard crew were up at Third Point and there was a couple of us down in the, you know, inside riding first point on longboards and really not that many of us. It, it would get crowded on the weekends. Definitely when it was pumping, it would get crowded. Mm -hmm. But you'd even find weekdays during the summer that were just really chill, you know, and there was like a handful of us, more than a handful, like, a, you know, a couple groups of us that were just all really you know, I mean, it still really has that community feeling. I think personally, that's been my experience. Like it feels like home, Definitely. you know, or like cheers, you know. Yeah. Um, it also has that kind of wild heavy metal parking lot vibe to it. For sure. And that's like also hilarious, especially when there's swell in the middle of summer. Um, but yeah, everything changes. Everything has its like seasons, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think it was kind of more like it, it felt like fall then. Yeah. As in, like, there was just a bit more space at that time. Right. And now it feels like full summer almost all the time. Yes. Yeah, I find that as well. Can you talk a little bit about kind of your trajectory? Like, you came here, I know you skateboarded before you surfed, correct? Yeah, I skateboarded before I surfed. And, um, you know, it was just always riding a board that felt really cool to me. Um, I snowboarded before I surfed and, and, you know, I would boogie board and, and really it wasn't until I did junior lifeguards when I was 14 up at Leo Carrillo that I really started surfing that summer. Okay. So I spent my entire 14 year old summer up at Leo surfing kind of, you know, heavens and, and the backside during guards. And then after junior guards, we'd be surfing the point at Leo. Mm. So then that next summer coming here, I was just like so keen and didn't have to worry about smashing myself into body rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just like so excited to hang with everybody on the beach. And it also wasn't so tide dependent. Mm. And I didn't lacerate my feet every time I got in and out of the water like I did at Leo. So it was it was really cool. And everybody was so welcoming. I yeah. mean, and, 
you know, I think it was like first day on the beach, Eric Gross came up to me. He's like, hey, who are you? What are you doing? Come hang out, you know, and like invited me over to sit at the Palapa with everybody. Mm -hmm. Always longboarding. Did you ever ride a shortboard or did you go straight into longboarding? I just rode whatever. I mean, I, that first uh, summer when I was 14, my dad had a 710 blaster. That was the name of it. I think Becker made it maybe. Okay. Um, and it was called a blaster and it was 710, kind of more of like a mini Mao shape mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know? Um, and so that was really cool. Um, and then my, my dad and I shaped uh, like a 72 short board. And I mean, pretty much the rails were square. And every time I rode it, one of the fins broke off. We glassed it in the garage and it was horrible. I mean, a horrible, horrible surfboard. I can't even believe it floated. Uh, but yeah, I rode that a little bit, but you're a kid. So you just ride whatever, you know? Yeah. And you're sliding across waves at first point and you're learning the cross stepping and the style that you do right now, right? Like what, um, who, who, who did you look up to? Who were your influences? Definitely every single person at this beach was a huge influence to me. I mean, Brittany Leonard was a big influence to me. Mm -hmm. um, she was in like the magazines and she had such groovy style yep. and just was making all of her own clothes and stuff like that. I thought that was epic, you know? Yeah. Julie Cox was an influence to me as well because she was my junior lifeguard instructor. So I met her when I was 14 over at, um, you know, over at Leo. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked up to her, looked up to Ashley Lloyd. I looked up to Carla Rowland at that time. Um, you know, looked up to Dylan Jones and Josh Farbro. Mm -hmm. Dane Peterson was around a lot. Dil uh, like Dylan was just like awesome because he was a backsider. Eric Gross, absolutely. I feel like he taught me how to nose ride. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Joel Tudor. Yeah. Pretty much everyone, you know, like Jason Roglin, was, everybody called him butt lips. He was rad because he was like my age and was like surfing so good and in all the magazines. So obviously the brothers, Trace and Chad, you know, they were kind of like my peers and we'd all kind of get out of school and come down here together because mm -hmm. we all went to the same high school up in Agora. So there was a rat pack of us, and, and I definitely looked up to everybody in that whole crew. Everyone you mentioned, there's an emphasis on sort of style and grace, or they all have that in common, I think. Economy of movement, not a lot of like flary kind of things, but keep it really flowing. I think that just is like what Malibu invites, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's a perfect wave. If you're flopping all over the place, you can really see it. Absolutely. I think it accentuates things. Yes. It accentuates style one way or another. I f yeah. I find that with a lot of really good waves. Those, like Jeffrey's Bay in South Africa, it's one of those waves where it really expo you're exposed in a way. Yeah, totally. Yep. Um, you mentioned a time when it all sort of came together for you in Australia. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah. I mean, that was pretty wild. So, like, after my first summer here we went to Costa Rica and that was amazing. And then I got the travel bug. We went to the rabbit cacao event and then I heard about Australia. So that was like in July. And then in like March was the Noosa festival of surfing. Mm -hmm. So I was working down the street here at the time at Tommy Bahama selling really overpriced silk shirts, um, and doing every odd job I could to raise some money and all that other stuff. And, and, uh, I, was able to get a ticket to Australia. So I went over to Australia and that's really when everything changed for me because I caught a wave at Noosa up at Tea Tree Bay and Joel Tudor was paddling out with Donald Takayama and Jeff Hackman and they saw me get that wave and, you know, Donald asked Joel, like, who is that? You know, and I had my custom surfboard that I got for Christmas from my parents from Perfect Balance up in the valley. Mm -hmm. And I got like some hibiscus, like a hibiscus nose wrap band on it. And I was all fired up on it. You know, it was a single fin nine two, you know, and I was like, and I caught a cool wave by them and they were like, who's that? You know, and. I was like, oh, that's Cassie. She surfs Malibu all the time. And, uh, and then the next day, Donald came up to my mom, actually, because mm -hmm. my mom was with me. She came with me on that trip. She's like, well, if you're going to Australia, I'm going to Australia. You know, like, let's go on an adventure. And I, it, my mom, basically, she was one of, like, the chaperones. And that was the first time that Chad and Trace went to Oz, too. So we all went to Australia together, flew over there together. Mm -hmm. Miriam Goodwin was with us. Like, all just, like, so rad. You mm -hmm. know, it was like a club event, but, yeah. like, in Oz. And so we were all groms and, and Donald came up to my mom and I'm freaking out because obviously I know who Donald Takayama is, like legend, amazing person. Oh my God, why is he talking to my mom? And 
I guess he asked her, hey, like, I want to make your daughter a surfboard. Can I, ta- can I make her one? And my mom's like, well, she's standing right there. Go talk to her, you know? So, I mean, I think that also shows, like, Donald, just the respect. Yeah. You know, just respect and, sure. and just that style, you know? And so he came and he's like, hey, how about I make you a surfboard? And I was, like, over the moon and couldn't wait. So we went back to California. I got my driver's license. And pretty much my first trip in my car, right when I turned 16, it was in April, I drove down, picked up the board, was so fired up. He made me a 9-2 uh, tri-fin nose rider, the DT2, and I rode it as a single fin. And I went and surfed uh, the event. It was a Roxy Jam at Sea Street on it, won that event, and then they sponsored me from that point on. And so it was kind of like a really poignant time in my life, Mm -hmm. you know, like all of a sudden I had a surfboard sponsor who was the best to ever do it, you know, Donald Takayama legend, you know, and became a huge mentor of mine for many years. I mean, still is, even though he's gone, like so many of the things he taught me, I still navigate life that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and got put on the Roxy team. And then it was like a, you know, I think I was with them for maybe 15 years of my life. Wow. So it was like a whirlwind. Wow. Well, uh, I want to get into all that. But before we do, I want to hear more about Donald. What, when you say that, because I've heard that, you know, I've talked to Joel Tudor and he says the same thing. I never, I, ne- I don't think I ever met Donald, but I've obviously a legendary figure in the surf community and I've heard such great things. But when you say he sort of taught you things, imparted things upon you, uh, what would it be? Oh my gosh. I mean, always be gracious with people. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those people that always would take everybody along for the ride. You know, he was a real community person Mm. in the fact that like, we'd all meet up at the beach. There'd be like 10 of us. We'd go surfing and then he would take us all out to lunch. He was always giving back. Mm. And it was always about the community Mm -hmm. and taking care of everyone and not excluding anyone. Mm -hmm. So I think like, you know, I'm not Hawaiian. Like I grew up here in California, but, and he's been here for a long time in his life, you know, obviously coming over and, and, uh, doing what he did um but really it was like you you know that idea of like aloha spirit and like really the community around the ocean and the community around surfing and surf culture and and being stoked you know Mm -hmm. um he also just the way he navigated the water he wouldn't get in the pack with everybody he would paddle out sit further out than everybody wait for his handful of waves get a couple waves all the way to the beach and that was it hmm so that was a really cool way to watch how somebody navigated the water. Yes. They were not taking any more than they needed. Yep. No, it's so interesting. I think there's so much in that. Um, the people who go out and just catch everything that comes in versus the people that sit and wait. And then um, I remember talking to someone about Skip Fry and they were saying how Skip has a thing where he rides every wave to the sand, like where his fin hits the sand. And it's sort of don't waste any part of that wave. Once you've taken off, you're committed to riding it. Um, I love that. I think it's really beautiful. Um, so sponsored by Roxy, a lot of travel, right? So much travel. I mean, I was like, you know, once I got sponsored by Roxy, which was like during that time, like right after that C street event, you know, um, I just started traveling. I think the first place they sent me was the Maldives when I was like almost 18, you know, that next year, Mm -hmm. obviously my first year surfing with them, I was just like getting to know them, surfing around here, doing a couple like catalog shoots and stuff. Then I got invited to the Maldives when I was 17. Mm -hmm. They sent me on that trip. And then it was from that point on, just go, go, go. Once I graduated high school, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they would take me to Hawaii for like a week or two. I was still in high school. So it was kind of like, you know, that Maldives trip was a pretty big one. And then after I graduated high school, I just was like on, I was Mm -hmm. like, I told my parents like, Hey, you know what? I'm sponsored by Roxy. I'm making my own money. Um, I'm working, I'm doing my stuff, you know, like, let me go for it, Mm -hmm. you know? And they're like, yeah, if you're making your own money or paying for your own life, do what you want to do, you know? So I went to Australia, bought a car there, kind of cruised around, lived in the car and, and just started traveling. It was like a seasonal travel, you know, like Hawaii was part of that. Australia was part of that. France was a big part of that because Quicksilver France and I was spending a lot of time with Ryan Hackman and Jeff Hackman at that time over in France and getting to know that zone and, um, and yeah, just feeling so grateful for so much time 
to be able to travel. That was the first time I went to Bali. I think I was 19. Hmm. And that was when like there was I don't, uh, Changu. All I remember about that place, it was just like rice fields. Yeah, that's what everyone says. Yeah. What a great, what a sort of interesting odyssey to go on because had you been a short border and chosen to be chasing points on the world tour or chasing rankings on the world tour, you would have you would have had an entirely different experience. You might have traveled, but you would have had the blinders on probably a lot more. You would have been focused. The trips would have been about, did you win or did you lose? Um, and I've always really admired this uh, about, you know, free surfing and then longboarding as well, because I think it's, it's a little less fiercely competitive in that way. There's a lot more of kind of smelling the roses, so to speak, or, or when in Rome, you go to places and you, it would be like a, a, um, a travesty to not sort of throw yourself into them. Like the whole idea is to go and experience them, right? Absolutely. I mean, every time I was going somewhere, it was to immerse myself in the culture, you know, and I feel really grateful. Sometimes there was a contest, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, there's a contest in Australia. It's over this one week, the Noosa Festival of Surfing. But I'm going to go to Australia for three months. Yep. And I'm going to check out like that was like almost the excuse like, oh, yeah, I'm going over there for a contest in France. It was the same. You know, there was a Biarritz or festival and I would go over there every year. You maybe win like a hundred dollars if you won the contest. We weren't there to win money. Yeah. You know, it was about going to Europe and spending t my whole summer in France. I'd be there for two, three months at a time, you know, like definitely like July and August. I'd be there you, and then sometimes into September and be traveling into Spain and mm -hmm. really immersing myself in the culture and immersing myself in these places and really going on what it felt like was a seasonal journey, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like if I sit back and think about it now, I feel like I'm having like an epiphany talking to you actually about it is like I would travel by the seasons and it felt really natural yeah. to my like rhythms. Right. And that was a really, I feel very grateful to have grown up that way and very grateful to have grown up without a phone. I mean, uh -huh. most of these places I was going to, somebody told me to go to this place and I'd look on a map and then I'd end up probably lost and find somewhere else. Or I learned how to meet, read maps pretty well. You know, you talk to people, you get like advice, you know, somebody's like, oh, go down this road. Like there's great waves over there. So everything is open to discovery and you're constantly looking up with your eyes open. Mm -hmm. Like not only are you feeling open to adventure, open hearted, open to the experience, but like your eyes are up and open. We're not looking looking down at our phones. We're not like, we weren't even in that space, you yeah, know? Sure. So that was really nice. Cause I feel like there was like a romance in discovery. Mm -hmm. Are there any places that you went or a, a specific place that really, you really connected with or you've, you know, everywhere, like really had their own flavor, like their own, like color palette, their own sound, you know, mm -hmm. like Australia had its real feeling to it, you know? with the birds that would be chirping every day, yeah. you know, with the way that the sun comes up there, mm -hmm. so much different to how the sun comes up here mm -hmm. because it's like, yeah, the East coast, it's rising over the ocean. Right. Yeah. You you're know? looking straight at it and totally different tone, yeah. different feeling, yeah. you know, different smells. Yeah. Hawaii really has its own smell. Like every time I step off the plane there, I really f smell and feel a certain tone to it. For sure. You know, yeah. um, the trade winds have their own feeling, all that, you know, um, I think like one of the places that I always really love going to that always felt very like home like as well was Mexico. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom's Mexican. I have a lot of like, you know, blood line from Mexico. So that just feels it also is very like just California, mm -hmm. you know, as well with sure. that high desert terrain and that little bit of dusty road kind of feeling i i just love like mexico in that way you know and and beans and rice all day mm -hmm. but everywhere was special and unique in its own way like being on a boat and spending time in indonesia and the mental eyes as a kid like mm -hmm. you know just being out in the middle of nowhere and just like no sounds no anything just stars around you yeah you know that was just like wild yes i, I when i realized i was a, a good traveler was I hit a point where pretty much everywhere I went, I thought I could live here. You know, it, it was sort of, I wasn't waiting to go home and anxious to get back to my life. It was sort of like I could start a life here in a second and be very happy. Totally. You know, I felt really at home wherever I was, you know, feeling like what, like, cause I am like at home wherever I am. Cause that's me. And my home is like what I carry with me. And also it's everywhere really, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's not like walls around me or where I get my mail. Yeah. Do you travel 
as much now as you did back then? Or was that like the concentrated period that you were at it? You know, up until I was around 30, 31, when I left Roxy, I was on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. I was probably on the road like nine months out of the year. Okay. And to be honest, I got a little bit fried by Mm. the end of it. I was on planes all the time. Uh Like I would go to like France for like a two day thing, Mm. which is crazy. Yeah. You know? Not only is that just like not sustainable for your physical body, you know, um, but I was just like kind of tired, just like anything. Like I was like, okay, like I need to kind of like slow down a little bit. And then I kind of like left my sponsors um, just because I was like, I felt like I wanted some new challenges and new experiences, new feelings. I Mm -hmm. wanted to like test new muscles, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And so I was kind of like, not disenchanted, but I got a little burnt out. Mm. Um, just burnt out by like the schedule, burnt out by the movement, burnt mm. out by just what in my experience was like a little bit of like, I don't know. It just didn't feel like the family that it felt like before. Well, no, I know. And I remember I wrote a profile of you for the Surfers Journal many years ago. And I remember talking about it. And and I won't put words in your mouth, but I, I think we talked about being a sponsored athlete can be a little bit like a trained seal where you're kind of like doing things on command. And, and it's an interesting one because surfing is such an art form and it's so close to our hearts. And to to compromise that, it can be really hard, you know? Do you think that is was something specific to Quicksilver or do you think it was maybe you matured in a way where you started to look at the commercial surfing world in a different way? I think it was like multiple ways, you know? I think the entire surf industry was kind of going through growing pains at the time. Yes. You know, I think it was like a whole industry standard thing. I don't think it was any company specifically. That was just my experience because that was the big company that I worked for. Mm -hmm. You know, um, everybody wanted more. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much juice you can squeeze out of a lemon. Yeah. You know, so it felt that pressure, Yeah. you know, and it also was like a little bit sour. Yeah. And kind of stung. Yep. You know, didn't feel good. Right. And then I also think it was myself maturing. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, I had an opportunity to travel to so many developing nations throughout my entire life. And I really saw our first world consumerism and how that was exploiting these beautiful places. Mm. You know, it's like, where do we put our garbage in other people's front yards and Mm -hmm. backyards, Mm -hmm. but we're sweeping it under the rug. So I also was like, man, I'm working for these big companies that are like billion dollar industries that really aren't doing anything for the planet, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's all about more and more and more where that's not sustainable, Mm -hmm. you know? So I just felt like there was all these things, you know, and had like a little bit of like an existential crisis, like, You know, like I felt like I was like feeding the machine and part of it. And like, what am I doing for the world? And like, I get to go ride a surfboard and get paid where people can't put food on the plate for their families. I just felt like weird. So what year was it that you had this sort of realization? I mean, I was probably 31. I was feeling the weight of it for a while. I remember I was on a trip and like Indo or something and... My good friend Dane was like shooting with me. And actually like this is going to maybe get too personal, TMI, but like whatever. Um, And like I just like broke down crying. Mm -hmm. And I like didn't know why I was like bummed. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like heavy. And I knew I needed to move my energy. Mm. Like I knew I needed something different. Mm -hmm. And it was like I was 29 at the time. Okay. So I knew something needed to shift. And that's when I moved up to LA and I started working with sound and vibrational therapy Mm -hmm. and just moving the energy for myself in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where it was leading, but I know I was having these different feelings that felt like riding waves, a different kind of wave. And it was like opening my heart up and opening my energy system up in a different way that I I didn't understand. And I don't quite understand because it's nonsensical, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a feeling just like surfing is you can't explain surfing to anybody it's just like it's not like a rational you know kind of thing that you can really and and at that time I remember I was like a little over surfing like Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to go surfing Mm -hmm. which was so weird because now kind of come full circle like almost 10 years later a little over 10 years later because I'm 40 now I'm like the frothing is grom Mm -hmm. about surfing Mm -hmm. ever yeah like I'm just so pumped yeah 
and re-inspired yes. about surfing and like what a beautiful feeling it is to ride a wave. Yeah. Like what? Yeah, I, I relate to that. I mean, I've sort of turned my back on surfing at various times and, and then I either come back to it on my own or radical shifts in my life have thrown me back to it, but it, I realize its value so much and the sanity that it produces. Totally. And we're like, you know, we're we're human beings like we need to you know test the edges we need yeah. to go out of balance completely you know sometimes allow ourselves to be fully annihilated to mm -hmm. find out what that place of balance is and to have perspective it's like we see through contrast that's like technically how our eyes work we experience through having those contrasts so it was like i knew i needed something i knew i needed a big shake up mm -hmm. and like it was just like moving back to la roots you know mm -hmm. not feeling like every day was summertime was mm -hmm. important yep making things feel really difficult and really hard mm -hmm. super huge and humbling yep. and important you're listening to soundings with jamie brissick this podcast and the surfer's journal are made possible due to tsj's subscribing members and through the sponsorship of birdwell FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. To learn more about the Surfer's Journal and its sponsors, or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Now, back to our guest, Cassia Meador. So walking away from your sponsorship and going out on your own, was that, did your friends think you were out of your mind? Everybody thought I was out of my mind, you know? I think I was out of my mind, absolutely, you know? But it was like, it was just something. I needed mm -hmm. to push myself in another way. And I could have done it smarter. Mm -hmm. And I could have done it in a more, like, methodical way. And I could have done it in a lot. I mean, I just could have done it so much different. And I didn't. I just kind of, like, flipped everything over and set it on fire, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. that was clearly what I needed to do to learn. Yeah. No, and know? I knew you at that time, and I remember you had a warehouse in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. You were doing wetsuits, and you were doing this fantastic surf wax that was scented Palo, Palo Santo? Is that yeah. how you said? Yeah. Fan you know, I grew up in the era. It's funny. My, my like, surfing heyday or my pro years the wax that we were using was bubblegum scented. And I always I feel like that. that says it all right yeah. there. That was that era. Um, Palo Santo is a great smell to have with you out in the ocean. I love it. And I love that you love that wax. I have some here for you, Jamie. So <laughs> I got you. I love it. You know? Um, so you basically walked away from Quicksilver Roxy as your sponsor. Mm -hmm. And you you're, you had been in, based in Oceanside, as I remember. Totally. Yeah. yeah. But tr based in Oceanside, traveling a lot. But you moved back to L.A. and you moved... To downtown or where were you? I had a place around Venice. I mean, before I left my sponsors, I like moved back to LA because okay. I was like, I needed a shift and I needed to be inspired. And it was just like this instinct thing, you know, that same instinctual feeling that brought me to the ocean, that same instinctual feeling that like pulled me towards surfing, mm -hmm. pulled me towards like, I need to go to Costa Rica. I need to go to Australia. I need to show up on the beach at Malibu. I need to do all these things. That same instinctual feeling that like pulled me around life was also the thing pushing me to LA. So I was like, okay, I have a feeling, I need to go there. I called a friend at the time. Um, she let me stay at her studio until I found a place and then I found a place and then, you know, I, and that's really when I started working with sound and vibrational therapy. So I didn't know what I was doing. I was just going off of instinct and feeling, which mm -hmm. is like literally what surfing tells us mm -hmm. to listen to our instinct and everything else in this world that we navigate ourselves in tells us to not listen to our instincts. Mm -hmm. So I think that I feel so grateful to be a surfer because like it has refined that instinctual tool, which is really our compass. No, I was going to say that. I mean, I always think when I was a young surfer coming up, I had, and I still have it to some extent, but you can kind of just gaze at the ocean and you can sense whether the wind's going to be coming on soon, whether the tide's dropping or uh, whether the swell's coming up. I mean, all that kind of obsession with the shoreline and what the waves are doing and the shape of it and everything else is cultivating those instincts so when you say just for our listeners sound and vibrational therapy what does that mean exactly i mean working with um tools i mean vibrational therapy like everything that is in this third dimensional reality from like a quantum understanding is vibration it mm -hmm. is sound and so working i mean ocean waves are sound 
you know, our bodies are sound. These microphones are sound. This van has its own frequency. You know, everything is frequency and, and waves, right? And so sound and vibrational therapy, I started working with bowls. I started working with, like, my own voice. I started work, working with, like, you know, flutes and gongs and these other tools um, that felt to me that they were bringing harmonic resonance mm -hmm. back to my being. Mm -hmm. So I started kind of like, at the time, we didn't know it. At the time, it just felt rad. I got a sound bath and I was like, what is that? And it really kind of fueled me pushing and leaving what was comfortable, my home in Oceanside, leaving going surfing every day, leaving, you know, all that stuff to kind of put myself into a place I didn't know where I was. Yeah, You know, I really think that working with the medicine of sound helped to push me to make those decisions for myself that sent me on another journey and gave me an opportunity to learn myself and know myself better than anything before. I think there's like a growing edge and pushing ourselves beyond what is comfortable into places that we discover who we are. Mm -hmm. When you were going through this change and you were exploring um, sound baths, etc., did you notice that your surfing changed at all? You know, it did. I think it was kind of in that time where for a couple years there, I was like a little jaded on surfing and I wasn't surfing that much, you know? Um, I think that for me, I was getting a lot of the same feelings, not physically, but like emotionally and energetically. And, you know, that I would get from surfing before, mm -hmm. but working with the sound. Mm. And when I would go surfing, it wasn't as often, but I would feel that joy. Like mm -hmm. I would feel the sound and the movement in the water, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, like it, it all kind of came together and I was like, wow, this feels so natural, mm -hmm. you know, working with these sounds. Like I'm not trained in any way musically right technically musically i'm not trained in any way but like it just felt so real mm -hmm. like the minute i picked it up and started working with it like i knew how to do it mm. because i guess in you know like that kind of like quantum science way that's what we are we are sound so it is innately us we are vibration mm -hmm. um so you've been doing a lot of retreats lately yeah yeah so we've been doing a lot of retreats lately you know um the retreats were something that came up because I think working on my own brand, I spent a lot of time by myself. I didn't have a partner I started with. I didn't have like, you know, I, I was grateful to work with different people along the time in the process. That said, I, I didn't, most of the time people have like somebody that they want to start with something with. So they have a partner to bounce ideas off. And I was spending a lot of time alone at that time. Um, and I was really craving community. I was really craving connection. I was really crea craving that kind of space with what surfing always kind of supported. Like surfing is such a community endeavor. Like you come to the beach and everybody knows you. You know what I mean? Sure. It's real like like community, you yes. know? So I was craving community and I, I noticed that people really wanted to learn and more people were getting into surfing, but they went to maybe a surf shop and somebody let them rent a surfboard and then they went out into the water and maybe put themselves and other people in danger. Um, you know, so people were wanting to go learn how to surf and, and I really wanted to go like create community and be with community and support other people as they're starting their surfing journey. And that also really helped to fuel me being re-inspired to surf mm -hmm. because when you teach, you know, you learn something again yeah. for the first time. So I felt like I was also learning with a lot of our guests and clients through the teaching and through the experience and creating these communities that feel so cool. And then it was also a place for my sound work to come in with sound bass. And mm -hmm. it felt like a place where everything, you know, that I've journeyed through in these last 10 years, you know, nine years, I guess, since I left pro surfing, um, you know, it all felt like it started to gel together. I'm like, yeah. oh, this is where it all comes together again. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe I thought that they were separate. Maybe they felt related. And here's where they live together and mm -hmm. they support each other. And then, you know, so I was working with other people and doing retreats like, you know, in Nicaragua and Costa Rica and other places. And then the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And then my really good friend Leah Dawson and I were sitting around and we've been friends for, gosh, like, 22 years now since I was probably 18 I met her um and we were like let's take people camping and surfing because we love camping and surfing it's so fun we met camping and surfing at Malibu for one of the club events when okay. we were kids you know so 
So nobody could travel. We started taking people camping and surfing, and then we started Salty Sensations. And we just went on our first international trip with Salty Sensations to Ireland. And oh, that great. was like, honestly, Jamie, it felt like I was 19 again or something, or like maybe 17, traveling again for the first time. I mean, my phone didn't work anywhere, so mm -hmm. that was cool because mm -hmm. I didn't have any navigation except for my own, like, you know, I wasn't on my phone. I just didn't work for me. But yeah, it felt really inspiring. So I think in a lot of ways, I've come full circle. Mm. How did the retreat go? How many people? Where did you travel to? How does it work? What is a typical day on a retreat? So typical days, we like to take anywhere from like, like, you know, eight or nine people. And I like the l less numbers. And then like 12, 13 is our max. Mm -hmm. When we take people surfing and camping, we do it at Santa. We kind of bookend, you know, summer with it. So we want to do it in like the fall or we want to do it in the spring because we don't want to do it midsummer and we don't want to do it in the, in the weekend. So it's kind of like a midweek retreat. You know, everybody comes down on a Tuesday. We have surfing all day. So like a big welcome dinner, opening circle, everybody gets to share, hear from each other. You know, most of us break down, hold space in a different way. Like, yeah, you know, a lot of people share, like they're there for surfing, you know, uh, we just get open. It's amazing. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's so fun to share what we all love together. And we all like know each other just by like this shared experience, you know, and it's a deep drop. Yeah. We have a big welcome dinner, opening circle. Next day we surf and we're at Sano from like literally when the lot opens there to when it closes. Is it exclusively women or anyone at welcome? We take everyone, you know, I have some retreats that I work on with people that have been exclusively women. And usually, um, when Leah and I do something, oftentimes we get a lot of women mm -hmm. and we're also co-ed open to everybody. You okay. know, we're doing the mall dives coming up nice. uh, in the next few weeks. We're going to go over there mid October till mid November. And we have two back to back retreats and they're both co-ed. Mm -hmm. And, and having recently turned 40, how do you feel like, where do you feel like you're at with your surfing? I feel like my surfing is just getting better again. I feel like there was like, you know, a, a couple years that, again, I was like disenchanted with surfing. Not disenchanted. That's not the right word, but just like a little burnt out. Mm -hmm. And then I went through a couple really bad injuries. I had a few really heavy concussions mm -hmm. that kept me out of the water. I mean, one of my concussions kept me from really walking and going outside for like a month, wow. you know? What Was that a uh, surf accident out here? Yeah, surf accident Someone in Malibu. Someone's board hit you? Somebody's bo somebody I, dropped in on me and I, their board hit me. I yeah. remember hearing that. Yeah. I remember being very upset about that. Yeah, it was a bummer. And to be honest, that also kind of, I was already having a hard time surfing and then that happened. So I kind of like got super scared about surfing for yeah. a little while and just was like in fear and and also just like I mean hurt you know like I, I, now they're really talking a lot more about concussion stuff but before that really big accident I had had a lot of concussions in my life surfing and snowboarding and skateboarding and doing other things so that one like really rocked me mm -hmm. like I'm still super sensitive like just the sun was hitting that thing and I'm like still sensitive to light and super sensitive to sound what happened specifically? Someone dropped in on you, their board hit you in the head? Yeah, so somebody dropped in on me. I went to kind of switch stances to kind of like edge them out of the wave a little bit. And as I came to turn around, they were at the top of the wave and they fell forward and kicked their board. The rail of their board just hit me right on my frontal bone. Oh, yeah. um, so my forehead and just took me out, you know, 30 stitches, three layers down to the skull. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Wow. I just like, it was gnarly, you know, it rocked me. And then I had a couple other concussions um, after that, one car accident and another one actually at the duct tape at Huntington Beach. Um, and that was in 2018 and it was my first heat and it was just like closing out shore dump and my board flew up and hit me in the head and I was seeing stars. I had to sit in a dark room down at the duct tape for a couple days after that because I wasn't even okay to drive home, you know? Oh, man. And then I dislocated my shoulder a couple times after that, you know? So there was a couple years that I was like keen to get back into the water and surf, like mm -hmm. really excited. And I kind of like, to be honest, couldn't. Yeah. Because I was just like injured, mm -hmm. like shoulders kept coming out, like stuff like that. And so I was just like, okay, like I want it, but I'm not ready. And it's like staying away. So I'm just gonna focus and get really clear, get really clear. I did a big cleanse. After that last concussion at the duct tape in 2018, I started studying craniosacral and polarity therapy because it was the only thing that gave me relief. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's like you can't see in the brain. I got brain scans. I had severe brain damage, um, did, you know, neurofeedback and stuff like that to help get my brain back on the level. Hmm. So a lot of things. God, it's incredible hearing all this because it seems like everything you've done, you've sort of, um, there's been this sort of investigation as a result of it or this, this, you know, being a pro server, going to see all these places, learning all these things, and then that, t- and then riding lots of waves, and that taking you deeper into um, sound and vibration, and then injuries, cr- making you study cranial sacral stuff. It's really, um, it's a journey. It's a journey, and now too, I think it's so important. It's something that we don't talk about in surfing. It's something that we don't talk about in a lot of things. Is like because we can't see the brain, mm-hmm. you know. And now, like I think it was just like this year. Now the WSL started doing brain scans for the athletes. So if somebody does have like a, a, a they look like they got rocked by a big one. Actually, they have like a baseline for mm-hmm. where they were at, you yeah. know. Um, you somebody breaks an arm, somebody dislocates a shoulder. For the most part, you can visibly see it. Mm-hmm. It's there, yeah, externally, yep. to be witnessed. You know, you lacerate yourself, you can see a cut. You know, but in our brain, we can't see it. Yeah, I mean, I went to the top neurologist at UCLA, and a he looked like the sickest person that I've ever seen in my life, and needed to get some sun, and also literally told me to take Tylenol, mm. and I was like, really? Hmm. And then go to speech therapy. Because I was having a stuttering problem through all, you know, my Jeez. brain inflammation. So yeah. he didn't tell me to change my diet. He didn't. I, I read all these books and I changed it myself. And like now it's like I've had conversations with other surfers and other people that have had similar things. And I'm like giving them like, hey, I did this. This is what helped me. Mm-hmm. I'm not prescribing you anything because that's not I'm just giving you feedback from my experience and what really helped me the most. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like also being really clear, mm-hmm. you know, like not drinking alcohol, not like putting any substance other than coffee really in my body mm-hmm. or else like, you know, I've done microdosing, you know, microdosing with psilocybin in very, very small doses, I think is actually really important. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I think that that's huge for the brain. Like yeah. Paul Stamets talks about it all the time. I've done the Stamets protocol, you know, and like, I think that there's ways to use these tools as medicine not use them as escapes. And I think that there's like a lot of opportunity there, you know? Um, But really it takes investigation because, you know, Western medicine for the most part is amazing when you need to get something screwed back together. You know, you need to get something stitched up. Amazing. It's a great last resort, you know, but then you go to them for like actually ways to improve yourself and to thrive. Mm -hmm. And they're just telling you to like, take Tylenol yeah. and you're just like really yeah cool like maybe I'll just like put a hole in my gut like yeah. w- for what mm-hmm. I don't have a headache right you know? yeah. <laughs> like yeah uh, um, you know like oh cool I can do some hyperbaric chamber work and I can actually go do neurofeedback amazing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um Cassia thinking about all your 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 entire career your life in surfing what are you most proud of Gosh, everything, you know, I think it's like not one single instance, but everything and continuing, you know, it's like now I feel like I'm at a time to give back in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. Like I'm putting back into the earth, you know, it's like I'm donating 2% of everything that we, you know, all of our gross sales directly towards reseeding kelp forests through all the different sea trees initiatives. I'm able to kind of educate people, um, by what I'm learning, not as in like a, Hey, do this, that, and the other. It's like, Hey, I'm learning this stuff. Let's have a conversation. Yeah. Let's leave this place better than we found it. You know, like let's do some cool stuff. Like I get to see like the kids, like all the kids surfing right now are ripping. Mm -hmm. They're surfing so cool. And it's so exciting to see. We can create those retreats and bring people together and it's changing their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know I needed this until I was here. And I feel so much better. And I've like created community. I'm doing something that I love that's empowering myself. Like, you know, I feel like I'm at the best place I've ever been in my life. I feel so grateful and so fired up. I'm so excited about surfing again. I'm working on a bunch of cool board designs and fins and all this other stuff with Dane Peterson, who's like 
one of my lifelong friends, you know, uh -huh. and we're creating and we're frothing and we're sitting on the, you know, floor in his garage drawing fin templates and like he's inspiring me, I'm inspiring him, you know, we're inspiring each other, you know, we're like I'm being inspired by different people, you know, I'm inspiring them. Like it's like just about kind of like, like I feel like I'm not feeding a machine. Yeah. I'm like feeding my soul and, you know, also in turn, like helping to do that for others. Like mm -hmm. everything that I've learned, I've like, you know, when people hit me up, like it's interesting when you go through stuff. One of my teachers says it's like, it's about resourcing yourself. And the more resource you have, the more people you're able to help. Because really you can't really help anyone until you've been through it. You know, and at this point in time in my life, I've been through so many things, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to continue to go through things. Mm -hmm. And in that, I feel more resource than I ever have been. And because of that, I can be a resource for others in wherever they need to be within their journey. And people come out of the woodworks for me. I'll be at a party and somebody will start talking to me about concussions. Mm -hmm. and there's no coincidences. Mm -hmm. It's just like we're having that conversation and they don't know why they came and started talking to me because they don't even maybe know me. And there we are. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're asking me and I'm like, oh, this is what I've done. And hopefully it can help you. And nine times out of 10, it really does, That's you so know, cool. and it's rad. I love it. It's freaking rad. Inspiring Cassia. I love it. I'm like so fired up. I can see that. It's cool. <laughs> Life rules, you know, <laughs> and it. it's up to all of us to make the difference. So, yeah. well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to chat with you in the van. So fun. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is written and performed by Paz Lenchanton and Gita Valtistodor. It is produced by Paz Lenchanton and engineered by Samur Kuja. Soundings is brought to you by The Surface Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. The Surfers Journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you again for listening to Soundings. We'll see you next time.